Perhaps we could start if we can. I'm paralyzed by the light in the back there, so I can't actually tell if there's anybody in the audience or not. But, um, so th this is a session about quality improvement. It's about culture. So if you thought you were in another setting, now's your chance. But uh, uh, So we would like to welcome you to this um, workshop, uh, basically. And, and what we'd like to do is we're going to have a series of presentations about just this topic and how we influence the culture. And we've, we've chosen different organizations that have been very successful in changing culture. And uh, we've asked them individually to speak for 10 minutes. And then uh, our goal would be to open that up to the audience. And there's microphones throughout the audience. And so feel free to ask questions and provide comments about how we could do this better. So uh, welcome, and thank you all for coming. So the presenters, which, uh, who I'm going to formally introduce in a moment or two, are before you there. And they all bring a unique perspective. It might be from a LIN, it might be from a hospital, it might be from an organization uh, individually. Um, but nevertheless, they've all uh, been a part of transformative change that has involved, actually, how we move the quality agenda at a larger scale uh, within a, at an organizational level. Uh, I thought I would do this for everybody. I hope that's OK. Um, and this is the disclosure of commercial support. Uh, this says we've uh, received no commercial support, and we have no conflict of interest. I'm getting nods. Um, and what we hope to accomplish during this period of time is that we want to uh, hope that we can impart some insight into what learning, uh, leading organizations have done to create and sustain a culture of quality and learn strategies for developing a culture of quality that focuses on putting patients first. So what are the experiences that others have had, good and bad, and what has led to success and not? So the panelists uh, I've already mentioned, there's some of their credentials. I'm going to introduce them just before their talk. So uh, I just thought I would leave that for you. So I'm going to set the stage very briefly, and then uh, we'll move right along the, uh, to my left and progressively go right to the left. So some context. Changes upon us must be driven by the quality agenda. So I believe very strongly about this. I'm concerned that if we don't drive change based on the quality agenda, the fiscal agenda will be what will drive change. And so my philosophy is that if you focus on the quality the money will look after itself because we know that a quality agenda is one that actually is cost effective. Yet at the same time, if we focus on the fiscal agenda, I'm very worried that we're going to lose sight of the quality agenda. And so as we think about the discussions today and how we change organizations, think about are we doing this from the perspective of quality? And if we are, will then that lead to some sustainability uh, after that? The second one is that I don't think we can change the culture without engaging the clinicians. Now, I'm not referring here to physicians exclusively, all providers. They must be part of the change process. This can't be externally driven, it has to be internally driven. They must own the successes of the organization. They must uh, drive it from the perspective of being providers and what's best for their patients and their communities. And then because I have a personal sort of vendetta about this, a process of change must benefit all. So as we think about this, is how do we ensure that the change processes that we're going to discuss today actually affect all and are available to all? And that's the equity driver for all of the discussions that we're having. So I think as we start to think about uh, some of the challenges that we face in changing cultures, remember that changing an organization, institutions, what are they? Well, their institutions are designed to resist change. That's why they're there. Complex processes, goals, structures, subcultures that are intricately connected, designed to resist change. Any change then leads to a corresponding change from the other parts to reset the status quo. So 70% of major organizations that embark upon a culture change will fail. 
The reason for that is this was not a wholesale change that involved all aspects with a consistent leadership aligning all of the resources of the community involved. So as we hear about the processes that are taking place in the different organizations today, think about and reflect on what some of the successes were and how did they embark upon wholesale change. And here, this is our, uh, uh, you saw this today earlier, but it highlights the aspects of what would be a quality healthcare system and what would be some of the principles underlying that change process. So are we changing to promote safety, effectiveness, patient-centeredness, efficient, timely, or equity? And you're gonna hear some aspects of all of those features. And below, you can see all of the elements that are necessary to make that happen, and we actually uh, had that presented to us earlier. Let me just reflect back very briefly about a year ago where I stood on a podium um, not in this room, but very close by. And we had surveyed all of the major leaders uh, in the healthcare organizations of all types. And we asked them what are their priorities for quality, some of the enablers, the barriers uh, within your organization. And we had 186 participants uh, respond. And just to remind you, they said our organizations are principally thinking about safety, patient-centeredness, some accessibility, a little bit about efficiency, and a little bit about integrated care. Now, if I was to do that again today, I think that might have changed a bit because of all of the things that have happened uh, over this last year. I think integrated care now with some bundled funding and some uh, aspects of what we're doing with LINs, I think integrated care is going to be, would uh, rate higher. I still think accessibility uh, is prominent, but I think uh, patient-centered care now is receiving a great deal more attention. But people did say, here's the challenges to change our organization. We lack motivation to collaborate. We lack financial support. Lack of staff motivation to implement. Lack of knowledge about uh, different QI initiatives. Lack of data. Regulations and uh, policies prevent us from changing. Uh, it's not considered feasible. All of those things are institutional impediments that are in our way as we, uh, as change agents, try and make effective change within the system. So the themes that we saw from that, there were some very significant systems issues about integration and alignment. It was issues that are related to leadership and supporting our leaders. And then we had to provide them with some infrastructure support. And I'm just gonna really briefly tell you about how could we help? We asked that question as well said, well, align the quality agenda. Be very clear. Communicate that quality agenda better. Provide better evidence on evidence-based practices. Communicate that. Help with spread and scale. Building quality uh, um, improvement capacity within our systems. So, and you can see the rest there. But those were the major ones you told us. And so just to end my session is over this last year, some of you may have heard, that what we've been trying to do is develop regional quality tables in each one of the LINs. And we're in the process of rolling this out now. And when we raised that issue with our colleagues in the LIN, and we thought, well, maybe three or four would bite and we could work with that. Well, all 14 LINs have said, no, we were very enthusiastic about this opportunity of bringing all our diverse groups and coordinating the quality initiatives from within at a regional level. And they really like the thought of having that link to a provincial quality uh, board. And so I think you'll see over this course of this next year, as we're now starting to recruit for chairs of those tables, that we start to have this coordinating body that can bring in capacity at a local level and uh, organize and focus many of our quality uh, initiatives. The table, in my mind, is a very easy piece. Uh, it's an organizational structural piece. Along the bottom, that is the hard work. There's the heavy lifting. How do we build in a learning environment? How do we uh, en get engagement and ownership? How do we apply KTE principles and um, applied research? How do we provide appropriate recognition, appropriate rewards? How do we fund and support this? How do we build capacity? And what are the incentives? And what are the outcomes that we're looking for? This is the culture of quality at the bottom. 
This will take several years to build. But nevertheless, there's a commitment at HQO to work with the Lins to try and build that culture of quality at each region in support of where we're going. So what we're going to do now uh, is we're going to hear from the different leaders uh, and many aspects of what they've been doing. And we're going to ask the panelists, panelists to describe the elements of creating a culture of quality, both the challenges and the opportunities that they faced, some of their strategies, and what were the elements of success. So I'll begin by introducing Wendy Levinson, a close friend of mine who's a national and international expert in the field of physician-patient communication, and in uh, particular, the disclosure of medical errors of patients. And in fact, Dr. Levinson was recently appointed the Officer of the Order of Canada for this work. Dr. Levinson has uh, led efforts to educate and engage residents and faculty members in um, patient safety, quality improvement, and stewardship of finite resources. Most recently, I think we'd all recognize her work as she's leading Choosing Wisely Canada, a campaign to help physicians and patients uh, engage in conversations about unnecessary tests, treatments, and procedures, and to help physicians and patients make smart and effective choices to ensure high quality care. Wendy? Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm very excited to share a little bit about Choosing Wisely Canada, which really grew in Ontario, was homegrown, and is a national campaign. And we're at the beginning of a culture change. It doesn't happen overnight, as uh, all of us will probably say. Um, and we have everything in our campaign in both English and French, so, uh, and it's all online, so feel free to access any of it. So I'm, I'm just going to begin by something you, you all know, which is, um, we all care about our healthcare system being sustainable into the future. We want high quality care and we want it to still be there. But almost all the research in this area says that a shocking number, 30% of all the healthcare services delivered are wasteful in that they don't add value to patients or they may even be harmful. That number originally came from the Institute of Medicine in the US and I think we all thought, oh well it wouldn't apply in Canada. But as you can see on this slide, our own and growing in amount of data is showing the same thing, that things that don't add value in Canada happen frequently. And uh, there's some listed there, and I'll just give you a little example. Here is one of preoperative testing in Ontario. This is patients who are go undergoing very low-risk procedures and are young and don't need any preoperative screening tests, really, and yet in Ontario, 30% of them, that magic number, get preoperative ECGs on this slide. But what's also really interesting is every one of those little dots is a different hospital. And what you can see is that in some hospitals in Ontario, only 3% of the patients get this EKG that's not necessary. And in some hospitals, 97% of patients get it. So we are very different in how we practice but there is a high level of us delivering care that could be changed to do the things that Jeff is talking about, improve quality, improve efficiency, and decrease harm to patients, in this case, potentially from false positive tests. So this is a core part of our goal, is to improve the quality of care and prevent harm. So Choosing Wisely, as Jeff said, is really a campaign, and it is patient-centered in that it is designed to engage physicians and patients, and I would say all healthcare providers, it did start with physicians, in conversations about whether tests and treatments are needed and help them make good choices. It's not to say that these things are not needed ever, but it's to engage in that conversation and change the dialogue that we have where we think more is better. Because at the moment, as you all know, if you work in the healthcare setting, Often patients will come in and think if they don't get a prescription or they didn't get a test, that they didn't get care because we've taught patients that more is better. And also physicians live in that culture. So what's unique about this culture change is it is clinician-led. It is a very bottom-up approach. There's nothing top-down about it. And it is focused on common clinical conditions depending on the specialty. It's primary care and specialty. It's extremely simple, and it has had actually pretty remarkable uptake because we started this campaign in, uh, we launched in April of 2014, 
And as I'll tell you, 45 physician societies in Canada have been working with us to create a list of five things in their discipline for which there's excellent scientific evidence of overuse, waste, or harm. So it is very much a bottom-up effort. And the approach is simple. We engage physician societies, like I told you, in developing these lists of five things that are unnecessary and educating their uh, physician communities across Canada through their organizations. We're gonna, I'm going to show you some of our growing patient materials because um, that is a fundamental part of this, is to give patients appropriate information. We've tried to work with the media to get the message out there. And um, as I'll also share with you, including giving you an example from North York General, even though Tim is on the panel from North York General, we are trying to help organizations implement choosing wisely in practice. So this little diagram just shows you where we are right now since April of 2014. We have almost 200 physician recommendations, or a little over. We're working with all the provincial territorial medical associations. We have a growing number of patient pamphlets. Um, at the bottom there in the little green, you see something called our early adopters organizations. It's actually our last webinar. We had 72 uh, participants on the call trying to learn. Actually, it was North York General presenting their data. And I'm going to tell you about STARS in a moment. So we think that after you've, we've created these lists, um, and I'm sure many of you have seen them, it, the real issue is how do you drive them into practice? How do you get these things implemented? And so there's simple strategies like giving a lecture to a group of clinicians or patient education. There are quality improvement projects and um, audit and feedback, which I think is very important. I'll give you an example. And there are things that hospitals are doing where they're embedding this in their electronic order entry. So here is an example from North York General in their emergency department where they sought to de there's a very comprehensive program of choosing wisely at the hospital um, with all kinds of strategies in place. But they wanted to decrease the number of laboratory tests done in the emergency department. Because as you probably know, if you've ever walked in there, you have to watch it. You get phlebotomized before you can say boo. And so they decreased by about 41% in a pre and post design the number of uh, tests being ordered in that setting. And they also did a number of other things in their hospital, looking at pre-op clinics and inpatient labs and ICU chest x-rays, where they were implementing choosing wisely and decreasing the use of unnecessary, not necessary, but unnecessary tests and treatments. In Ontario, we have um, a strategy, which is that we have the national campaign, but we have um, under HQO, we've brought all the par partners together on the provider side, this is the provider side, to pick provincial priorities, and as you can see, and try to drive them into practice. So in hospitals, pre-op testing, and the use of blood transfusions, where more is certainly not better, and sometimes they're really not needed. In primary care, a lot of annual tests, and in long-term care, the use of antipsychotics, in elderly patients uh, who don't have a psychiatric diagnosis. And we're trying to measure the impact of this in Ontario. So I just quickly want to tell you about our challenge. We are launching a 10 million challenge campaign to help prevent 10 million unnecessary tests and treatments. We're going to appeal to groups that can implement Choosing Wisely to register with us, get a starter kit, pick a target, like maybe it's blood transfusions or maybe it's the use of uh, unnecessary um, preoperative testing, implement the strategy, and share the results towards a collective target so we can look at our impact across Canada. Here's an example. You can, if you want to do blood transfusions, why give two when one will do? And this came from the Canadian Transfusion Society, and you would be able to choose this target, get materials from us, and participate in the 10 million campaign. Uh, you might be interested in not catheterizing patients as much because we know they get infections and they're not really helpful. And so we, you could join the Lose the Tube uh, campaign that comes from the Canadian Society of Internal Medicine. And I, so that, that is, that we're going to be implementing that over the next period of time. I just want to have a moment to tell you about STARS because in the, in the spirit of culture change, this is learned in medical education at the ground up, and students carry those practices through their career. Our own medical students have created a campaign 
called STARS, Students and Trainees Advocating for Resource Stewardship. They have created a list of six things medical students shouldn't do. They are now meeting with students from across the country to engage in getting students involved in changing the culture. On the patient side, we need to get the message out that more is not always better, that you don't have to go home with a prescription or a test in order to have gotten care. And we think humor might be helpful, so more is not always better. Maybe this will happen right next door at the Blue Jays game later today, or a little too much mustard. Um, or more is not always better. Um, and we will have a, a variety of images, videotapes, screensavers, and these questions that we're aiming to put in primary care doctor's offices so that family physicians can engage in these conversations with the help of additional materials and um, be able to explain why a patient doesn't need an MRI for low back pain, for example. So this is really all about a culture change. What I've tried to show you is we've been very in, uh, purposeful in a bottom-up approach that is led by clinicians. It is not about cost, as Jeff mentioned. It is all about quality and preventing harm. When people ask us about cost, we say, well, gee, in some cases, it may save money if we eliminate unnecessary preoperative screening tests. But in other cases, like MRIs for low back pain, it's going to mean that the right people are getting the tests when they need it, perhaps decreasing the, the length of time waiting for people who really need those tests. So we're really engaging the community. We're engaging students. We hope to work with pharmacists and nursing. And this is going to take some time, but we're on the beginning of a journey. So I will stop there and turn it over to Tim. Thank you very much, Wendy. That's, that's fantastic. So uh, Tim Rutledge, uh, President and CEO of the North York General Hospital since 2010. I think there's something in the water at North York, frankly. There's something there. You just actually have to walk through the doors and you sense that this is a, an organization that's enthusiastic about uh, uh, quality. So I've been very impressed about all of the great stuff that's coming from the North York General. And I suspect it has no uh, short measure as a result of Tim. Um, strong um, has focused on building a strong values-based culture as a foundation to the hospital's pursuit of excellence in integrated patient-centered care. Uh, also a passionate advocate for continued evolution of North York General Hospital as a community academic uh, hospital. Tim has held a number of leadership uh, positions at North York General, including Chief of Emergency Medicine, Chair of the Medical Advisory Committee, Vice President of Medical Affairs and Academic Affairs. Tim is an Associate Professor at the Department of Family Medicine and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. Thank you, Tim. And Tim's actually, Tim's been very kind. Well, you get cut off. Very right? kind to uh, come here. He's uh, just come back and is very viral as a result of an infection. So uh, we'd like to especially thank him for joining us. I'm getting better. I don't work when I'm sick. <clears throat> anyway, Jeff, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, share some of the work we've been doing at North York General Hospital in the area of quality and safety. And the way we've gone about that has been really, really well aligned with, with the topic of this, uh, this uh, session. Um, we have been very mindful since the beginning. This journey that we've been on has really been over 10 years. And we've been very, very mindful about the importance of uh, developing or evolving a culture that enabled the kind of quality activity that we wanted to be in and uh, involved with. So. Uh, just a bit on quality. Quality is, of, or sorry, culture. I'm, I'm going to focus on the cultural aspects and not so much on the uh, on the quality initiatives and safety initiatives we've done. Uh, and culture, culture is a, a a very, um, I would say, kind of an amorphous concept, but absolutely critically important to be attent attentive to. Um, Jeff, thank you for mentioning something in the water. I think what's in the water is the culture. Uh, and I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you, you, you palpated something there when you, when you visited us. But uh, uh, we have been, we, you know, we think that you can't leave culture to chance. I think you have to be really, uh, really mindful about it. And so we have. We really see culture as being inextric inextricably linked with leadership. And I'm not talking about leadership at the senior team. I'm talking about leadership throughout the organization. 
and values. Uh, culture will come out of your values. And so I see culture, leadership, and values as all being part of that, so that sauce, the spice in the water, whatever it is, that will enable whatever you're trying to do. And of course, our focus was quality and safety. So we studied what kind of cultural features enable quality and safety. Those three things uh, actually establish what I think of as an organizational experience. Your values, your culture, the leadership, that, the kinds of leadership development you've done through your organization create an experience in your organization. Uh, what it's like to work there if you're a staff or a physician or volunteer. And uh, even though it's a